Hey everybody, Darren from The White Hatter and welcome to Thinkable Thursday. And today we are extremely honored to have a special guest with us today. And today we are gonna be speaking with Julie Clegg, uh, Clegg and she is the founder and CEO of uh, Human Intelligence Services. And she lives in Vancouver, Canada, but she came to us by way of the UK and you'll, you'll hear that in her uh, accent pretty soon. And she has her own company. She's the CEO and founder of The Human Eye. And what's even, uh, what's, what's even really more interesting about it, she's written a really cool book called World Class Investigator. And guess what? I have that book with me right here. And there she is, there's Julie. So Julie, um, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you, Darren. Excellent. Uh, so, great to be here. Yeah, and it's an honor to have you here as well. So why don't you uh, share with our viewers who you are, a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm originally a, a police detective from the United Kingdom. I was with the West Yorkshire Police for 10 years over there mm -hmm. and uh, moved over to Canada to, I uh, took a leave of absence so I could come over and learn more about uh, internet investigation and intelligence. Uh, this was back in the day before Facebook, before social media as we know it, uh, when the internet was being used more for commercial purposes and um, and it didn't really have the, uh, the user-generated content element of it uh, that it does now. It, that was just starting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I moved over here um, and I just, and I fell in love with technology um, and using technology to fight crime. That really was my um, was the thing that was my passion, and then throw you know psychology into the mix, throw profiling into the mix, and and that's what I've built my career on. Um, I spent the next ten or so years traveling around the world, teaching law enforcement, government, military, Fortune 500s how to use the internet for investigation purposes. So how to find stuff, how to do that securely and uh, gather evidence and profile people and, and basically use every element of the internet for investigation purposes. And But then I found that I missed the front lines. Uh, yeah. That came about, um, that realization really happened because I started doing the TV show Hunted uh, back in 2015 in the mm -hmm. UK. And uh, just being in that environment again, being back on the front lines of investigation and actually um, working with a team to find people online and hunt them down, even though it was in a, a you know a constructed setting, um, it just reignited my my passion for investigation proper as opposed to instruction. So I uh, I launched my own company, uh, launched Human Eye Intelligence Services, and then uh, that led into you know being on the TV show really kind of raised my profile quite a lot in the investigation and, and intelligence field. Right. And I ended up um, getting lots and lots of questions. I had quite a large social media following. So I got quite a lot of questions. You know, how do I get to do what you do? How did you get mm -hmm. to do that? What do I need to do to, um, you know, how do I make this my career? You know, what you do looks so cool. How do I get to do that? And, um, and so I was having a lot of these same questions over and over again. And I figured, well, Rather than answering all of these hundreds of questions on social media, I'm just going to write write it down in a book, and then people can access it in my book. And uh, that's how I wrote how to become a world class investigator. And um, and the book has been really well received. Uh, I, I you know I've had lots of um, lots of sharing of that. It's been very popular. It's you know the feedback I've received is that it has helped an awful lot of people really. Uh, decide on their path in becoming an investigator in whatever you know configuration that looks like for people doesn't have to be the same way I've done it there's lots of different investigation jobs and lots of different roles in cyber crime cyber security um, cyber psychology the, there's tons of different paths that someone can take yeah. so I think it's been useful in that and then more recently, um, I've also become the CEO of another company, a, a company in the United States, in New York, uh, Harden. And um, that is a cybersecurity uh, and technology company. So more about that later. But um, certainly my focus uh, remains in go. investigation, remains in cybersecurity. And um, I'm still building on that. 
look at you go. Like, you know, it, it's so cool to see um, a professional woman like yourself take over leadership roles within the tech field, right? Because I, I do think the tech field is very much male dominated. At least that's been my experience. And it's so cool to see people like you. And, you know, when I first met you, you probably don't remember this, was on one of those courses that you taught many, 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 many years ago. That's when I first learned about you. And, you know, being ex-law enforcement as as well, you know, although I'm retired and although you left to do other, um, I still bleed blue, right? Like I, I love the hunt and that's why I got involved in OSINT work. And just so our viewers know, what does OSINT mean? What does it, what does it stand for, Julie? Uh, open source intelligence. Yeah. And so yeah, what does we, that mean? Um, we tend to use that as a, as a bit of a catch all. I mean, it's, um, you know, it actually, OSINT actually originates from after or during the second world war when, uh, open source intelligence, what the, the term was really coined for communications that were intercepted and these were um telegrams back then not mm -hmm. we're not talking digital open source intelligence uh but these were communications transmitted uh that were translated uh to, for news sources for journalists and for investigators um investigating communications between uh the germans and and also other um opposing forces so that was considered to be open source intelligence uh, nowadays of course we apply it much more to uh, technical and online uh, the the online environment and basically searching for any publicly available information so any unclassified or declassified information by any means necessary really um, of course by legal means but really now um, it's more in line with open source investigation as opposed to open source intelligence, which is which seems to be a bit more of a military term. Yeah, I am so looking forward to this interview. I mean, it's just it's just I think it's so timely given what's going on right now, given the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic and everybody being online. So why don't mm -hmm. we get to some of the questions that uh, I want to share? And the first question that I have for you is um, the FBI this week stated that they have seen a quadruple in the number of complaints that have been registered by them during the COVID-19 pandemic. What are you seeing as an online investigator? What are some of the things that you're seeing? Yeah, so I would certainly agree with, the, with that statement that in terms of, you know, one of the, of course, what we're, we're always seeing uh, and what has been an, an increasing problem is the uh, the prevalence of organized crime and the internet facilitates that. Um, it's interesting what, in addition to phishing and that type of scam, we're also seeing an increasing property crime um, as people are going out there and, you know, these are, these become desperate times for people and desperate times call for desperate measures and we're definitely seeing people uh, committing uh, either property crime or they're going online and committing crimes online. And most of the types of crimes that people will commit that are low risk, opportunist, that allow you to um, go after a, a, or target a large number of people at the same time is phishing. Mm -hmm. uh, for people that don't understand what phishing is, what we're talking about is uh, when you receive an email and you have to click through a link and the purpose is for somebody to gather some information about you to be able to access uh, your personal information and ultimately relieve you of some of your money. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's the ultimate purpose of phishing. But it doesn't necessarily come through an email link. Sometimes it might come through a phone call. Sometimes it might come through a text message. There's many ways, but ultimately the idea is with a phishing um, attack, is that you commit some kind of action in response to something that is sent to you electronically um, and ultimately you lose some of your money. Um, and have you and seen, it's, have it's you a seen difficult specific? area because, you know, we also see... Sorry, go ahead, Darren. Have you seen specific phishing attacks attributed to COVID-19? Oh, absolutely. Um, there are, uh, you know, quite a number of attacks that prey either on people's sympathy or empathy or fear. So this may be um, uh, companies purporting to be uh, from the government. So saying that, you know, click through this link to claim for certain things 
or it may be um, a medical type email where it's saying, uh, you know, we have some, uh, you can come here for testing or we have some results for you or we have uh, some advice for you around COVID. Click through this link to watch this video or to access this material. Mm -hmm. So definitely seeing uh, people preying on people's fear or, or vulnerability around COVID. Um, and, you know, social engineering coupled with um, phishing is very powerful. So if you have information out there or your information has been obtained through some kind of, uh, some kind of data breach and your email address is out there coupled with your Facebook account or some of the social media information about you, quite easy to build a profile on somebody mm -hmm. and it's in the interest of these organized criminals or opportunists to uh, you know to put in that half an hour of research to, to get some money out of you um so we're seeing quite a lot of that for sure and are you finding that there's more specific groups that are being targeted for lists like a, a good example is i've got some real concerns right now about seniors who are going online more and more, and they seem to be more at risk for some of the financial phishing attacks that are going on. Like, are, are you finding that as well, where there are some specific groups that are more vulnerable than others? Absolutely, and, and certainly, Darren, you're absolutely correct in terms of seniors. You know, what we're seeing, of course, right now is that people are increasingly isolated um, and afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, seniors are not necessarily as tech savvy as some of the younger people, and they may be venturing online or, or into certain parts of the online world that they have never had to use before. So, you know, they may be using Zoom, they may be using, you know, certain communication tools that they're not familiar with, and may be persuaded to click on a link or something that sounds or looks authentic, um, because they they don't know any different. They, they're not aware of what a phishing email looks like. They're not, uh, and, and they're, they're scared. People react. It, it creates a very visceral reaction in us when we are afraid of something, when we are triggered in a certain way. Um, I'm not sure if you've experienced the CRA uh, phone calls. I have had several. But the first time you get that, doesn't matter who you are. If you are a, a decent, honest person that is not used to receiving that kind of communication, it affects you. It doesn't matter who you are or how tough you are or how um, how familiar you are, familiar you are, and even when you know that these things aren't real, um, that those first couple of times you get that phone call that says uh, you owe money to the CRA, you're going to be arrested, you're going to, you know, you've got this black mark against your name. If you're a decent person who has always tried to do good and always tried to stay on the right side of the law. When you get that call, it creates a fight or flight reaction in you. Yeah. That even just that first time, mm -hmm. um, you know, and when you're dealing with elderly people mm -hmm. that are in an unfamiliar territory, unfamiliar territory that are already afraid and anxious about something like COVID, that are um, struggling financially or have been cut off from the um, the support and the connection from their family, and they're isolated very, very easy for them to, to be placed in these vulnerable positions where they can, they can, mm -hmm. you know, they're an easy target. You know, the, the other group that concerns me as well, seniors were number one, but I'm also finding that those under the age of 12, right? right? Because all these kids are at home right now. Parents are trying to figure out how to keep them engaged. So they're giving them these devices more like digital pacifiers and the powerful tools that they are. And as a result of that, because young kids really don't have a lot of critical thinking ability, um, they too are finding themselves in these positions. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing, uh, I think it was yesterday it was announced there was another large scale data breach of children's data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are more and more young people online and more and more young people being targeted for that reason. Um, they, you know, these kids are at home, be, they have iPads, they have phones, they're not being monitored as closely because the parent is still trying to work from home yep. and the parent yep. is now having to take care of a young person at home um, when they're trying to do their job. They're in a very difficult position. You cannot mm. monitor a child all the time. How do you possibly 
make sure that you know what your child is doing. It's not it's not like it used to be. Um, you know, we are in unprecedented times. And I don't blame parents for using these tools for um, for educating their kids. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of kids using uh, iPads for education at home. A lot of courses and classes are being run online. And these kids, yeah, they may be doing their schoolwork online, but they're also playing and communicating online in unfamiliar territory without... Um, necessarily a great deal of parental oversight because the parents are busy trying to make a living or, or, you know, pay the bills in these times. So we're definitely seeing children being targeted. And this is for everything from, um, you know, personal data targeting to sexual exploitation to, um, you know, luring, being, being lured into conversations uh, by organized criminals or by people that target them for future exploitation or future financial exploitation. And this segues very nicely into our next question that I have for you. And the next question is, you know, what are some of the things that online users, especially parents, should be looking for to help prevent being targeted for an online crime? So what I would say uh, to this is, you know, it's difficult for some parents to to look for or, or to recognize what these signs are because, again, we are in unprecedented times. So there is a lot that's unfamiliar right now anyway. Um, my biggest advice always is to listen to what your child is saying. Hear them. I, You know, we are all guilty. I am a parent myself. Um, it's not just a case of, uh, you know, kids ask pertinent questions. And quite often as parents, through no fault of our own, we're busy and we're stressed. We don't actually listen to what they're actually saying when they ask us a question. The information we need is often in that question. And we brush that question off or we dismiss it, uh, not wondering where that information came from or why that question is being asked. Um, children are curious and they want to understand if they're told not to tell a parent, you will often see a change in behavior in children. You'll often see them becoming more introverted, going, spending more time in their bedroom. You know, I'm going to go and do this studying in my room. I'm going to, you know, check the device for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, most devices contain history of what the children are doing. Look in the deleted photographs uh, folders, that kind of thing. Make sure if you have a young child, that you're aware of what they're doing. You can't necessarily sit and look over their shoulder all the time, but you you know your child. You know what their behavior is. You know if they're hiding something, if they're uncomfortable. I would say just be with them, tune into them, know what they're doing. Um, you know. and, and you know, there's some really good research out there right now that is showing us that parents who participate with their kids online in a more mentorship, co-equal uh, environment, those kids are far less likely to get themselves involved in less than desirable behavior than kids that don't. So uh, I emphasize and echo what it is that you just said, is that we parents need to listen. And you're right, in today's world of COVID, parents are multitasking, right? They're juggling all these, you know, they're trying to work from home. Never mind, they may have two or three kids at home, all who need to get online to do stuff. And they only have one tablet or one access point. So there's all these things that are going on. And that's why it is so important that um, that we're communicating, right? And listening to our kids, which kind of dovetails very nicely into the next question I have for you, which is, you know what? I know that you're a mother uh, of a teen daughter and what are some of your concerns as a mother and an online investigator specific to her online world, both today and into the future? Let's hear some of your thoughts on that one. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I as the mother of a, of a teenage girl, um, just, you know, I get, quite often I get asked, um, you know, do you monitor her? Uh, does she have to give you her phone? Do you use the phone as either a, a, a discipline tool or, a, you know, how do you how do you monitor what she's doing? How do you check? And I, I guess I have a fairly a somewhat unconventional approach to this in that I have never told my daughter 
that the internet is a scary place. What I have done is educated her about um, biases, about critical thinking, about communication, and about how to uh, protect herself in situations where somebody would seek to harm her online. Mm -hmm. And she, and I've done this from a very young age, from, you know, for, for better or worse, my daughter's been raised by somebody that was a cop and also somebody that's very technically savvy. Um, but that being said, I still believe, and I will always believe that the internet is absolutely fantastic and it's a gift. And we, you know, it's something that I think if we use it correctly, is can make society and the world a better place and and can and is amazing for humanity but we have to be discerning in how we access information and we have to we have to know and we have to be able to detect when something is good or bad and that's what i've focused on with my daughter i have sat with her from my daughter could keyboard before she could write her name (laughs) and and so i've taught her how to think yeah online critical thinking, right? I mean, we as a company have adopted the same philosophy. We, it's all, for us, it's all about enlightening and not frightening, right? Uh, You know, it's, you know, one of the philosophies I always said, we still hear uh, people in law enforcement and child protection talk about stranger danger, stranger danger, stranger, stranger danger doesn't work. Why? Yeah. Because the online and offline predator understands that if I can remove that stranger stigma, I'm no longer a threat to the child. So rather than trying to scare the child, let's teach them about the tricks and the lures that these individuals are using. That way, it doesn't matter if it's somebody who the child knows or doesn't know. They understand that what that person is doing is wrong and therefore is more likely to react accordingly. Again, it's about enlightening and understanding that knowledge and the understanding and application of that knowledge is power. And I agree with you that, you know, this, this thing called the internet is a very powerful tool, but as wow. Uncle Ben in, in Spider-Man said, with great power comes even greater responsibility, right? And that's our job as a parent to shepherd our kids and mentor their kids in a cooperative. The other thing I find is that sometimes we parents think we know best, not necessarily. I mean, a yeah. lot of times I'm finding that a lot of teens and even preteens have a lot to offer us adults when it comes to this new on life world. That's what I like to call it because there is no no longer a difference between the online and the offline world, right? We adults, as parents still see it that way, but to the kids, it's just one world. Any other mm-hmm. thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I wanna come back to that stranger danger um, statement that you made because when you look at uh, kids online now or look at anybody online now, I, even myself, I have uh, a fairly extensive network of people that I work with and that I engage with on a fairly regular basis, on a daily basis, that I have never met. I know. They started yeah. off as strangers, and kids are even, their circle is even wider. My daughter has thousands of friends yeah. on social media, and these people are not people that she has ever met or will ever meet in yeah. real life, but that is her online circle. So trying to convince somebody that they shouldn't talk to strangers online is absolutely futile. <laughs> you cannot do that. Uh, it's not gonna happen, it's not realistic, and it's not the environment. These, we, you know, we're dealing with, from Generation X, uh, even from Millennials onwards really, but certainly Generation X, uh, Generation Z, sorry, um, these are digital natives. Their, their life, you're absolutely right, isn't split between online and offline. It's all intersected. The way that they communicate, the way that they socialize, uh, the way that they share information, the way that they do their exams, the way that they are educated, is that line is blurred now. So we cannot differentiate. And we need to find a new way of doing things, which is to make sure that they are discerning about the type of information that they give out and also what they receive and that they're able to critically think about what is uh, and how they verify both the sources and the data that they're receiving. 
Yeah, and and you know what, parental abdication on this issue is significant, right? Like, I, I I've heard a lot of parents say to me, well, you know what, Darren, I've taught my child about stranger danger, so they're going to be good to go online, and it's like, n no, right? Yeah. The world that you were brought up in is totally different than the world today. I mean, there's a reason why kids call us boomers, right? Because we older adults, you know, when I was in high school, I used to walk to school in snow this deep and stuff, and well, today uh, we're, uh, you know, we and we used to make fun of that right well the kids today are saying the same thing to because us parents are going to these kids well you know what if i put a dial phone in front of the kid today he wouldn't know how to use it well what relevance does a dial-up phone have to in today's society right so we're kind of losing track of those though that, that, that reality right yeah absolutely so which leads us into the next question so here's the next question which is do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will cause us to look at the online world in a different way? If yes, how? And if no, why not? Again, I'd like to call it the online world just because it's it's now synergized, right? So I'm trying to change thinking in people to get away from you know, the online world and the offline world. No, it's just one world is the online world. So what do you think about this? You know, we've got this uh, we've got social distancing issues um which is you know it's taking some getting used to for people it's very difficult challenging for people to be isolated but i think we're also finding new ways of communicating mm -hmm. uh, i think businesses in particular are finding new ways of doing business um that i'm not sure that we will go back to uh the old way of doing things in a in a lot of ways i think if we can i, I think we're seeing massive innovation in the areas of communication and business, manufacturing, product delivery, um, transport, you know, we're being forced to innovate and we're being forced to use the technology that we have to innovate more quickly. Um, people, while people still want to be together, I think we're going to, uh, you know, offices and businesses and meetings are going to be done more online. I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing the environment in a different way. I think we're seeing the the healing of the earth and the planet uh, occurring very quickly. And people are starting to realize that, oh, maybe we have been damaging our environment. Maybe the fact that we can now see blue sky again means that we shouldn't have all these vehicles on the road. Um, and the innovation is is alongside that that means that we don't necessarily have to have that. You know, we can do our meetings virtually. Um, we can do some education virtually. Um, you know, and, it, and in a lot of ways, while anxiety is higher generally because, but that's mostly because of the illness and the threat of um, this pandemic, I think some other people, I'm definitely seeing evidence of a lot of people saying, I'm actually really enjoying this. I'm really relaxed. I'm really, I, you know, I'm really enjoying this time at home. I'm really enjoying the lack of pressure to sit in traffic for two hours every day in my commute to work. I'm enjoying working at home. I'm enjoying spending more time with my children. I'm enjoying getting back to things that feel more organic and less contrived. And my life feels simpler. And uh, yeah, I have a bit less money, but I'm spending less money. Uh, or, you know, I'm not, I'm not, going out and doing things and i'm actually spending more time with my family again yeah. i think we're seeing a little bit more cohesion of the family unit um now of course the the other side of that which is a very serious side to me and, and something that causes me a great deal of uh distress when i think about it is the increase that we're seeing in domestic violence and child abuse and um i think that for me is something that um, you know, while we're while we will see an increase in some, um, you know, a positive a positive effect in the family unit, I also think that we will see a negative effect in the family unit too, because we're being forced into situations that obviously we could escape. Um, I think that there, there will be people that are suffering in an abusive situation that they can't get out of right now. Shelters are closed. Police are not able to imprison people because we don't have either the staff or the facilities and in fact people are being released from prisons because of the of the threat of covid so that's something that bothers me 
um, a lot about this, and I think that's one of the negative effects that we'll see of um, of this this COVID virus and this pandemic is people being forced to remain in abusive situations, and I I do worry about the effect that that is having on some children in families that you know, school was their safe place and their friend's house was their safe place for women and some men you know shelters being their safe place and um and and now that's not available to them so uh you know i think when i when i look at all sides of this i think there are some amazing and great changes that will occur and i think when all of this is over we'll you know we'll be seeing the fallout from this for for several months and even years afterwards. Yeah, I agree. You know what, I, just to build on a couple of those things, I was talking to a friend of mine, and, you know, I think it is gonna change business to a degree. Like if I'm a business owner and I'm leasing a building uh, for a half a million dollars a year, just so that I can have people sitting in cubicles working behind screens, but yet I can do the same thing from home well, and not have to pay a $500,000 lease, then why wouldn't I do that, right? I, I do think I, you're right on target. I think that this event, because we're now all sheltering at home, it's it's reconnected the human element to being family again. Like I, I'm, I'm hearing that from just tons of parents as well, saying that they've never spent as much time to connect with their kids and even their spouses and other family members as they are today. And I would also echo your concern about domestic issues, domestic violence issues. In fact, I'm hearing that from my uh, my colleagues in law enforcement uh, here where I live, which is Greater Victoria, but others across Canada as well. And that is a concern for oh. sure. Any other comments on that? No, I mean, I, I think, I. You know, I, I, I've been racking my brains and uh, I think about it every day. Um, it's always been a subject that's very close to my heart. I've, uh, you know, I, I have spent time um, as, a, as a volunteer in women's shelters uh, dealing with domestic violence. It's been something I, I you know, I'm a, an ambassador for a charity in the UK dealing with um, or supporting children and families that are victims of serious crime. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I've always believed in and I've always thrown my time into and probably out of any um any cause out there or any issue out there uh it's still the issue that's closest to my heart when when I think of domestic violence child abuse uh and also human trafficking those kinds of things any person being victimized in a way that they cannot escape from I think right now um is something that um I think we we have an opportunity to innovate around right now to come up with ways to help people escape from these kinds of situations. I don't know what the answer is. I don't have those answers. Um, I hope that with an increase in technology, an increase in uh, modern sli uh, um, modern slavery helplines, human trafficking helplines, domestic violence helplines, that people are able to still reach out and get that support um, using social media, social media groups and that kind of thing, that they're still able to uh, maintain some hope. Yeah. Deep. Like, I, I just, I truly do appreciate your honesty. And I can, I can, I can actually feel digitally your passion for that topic as we're talking about this, which is really needed. I mean, we as a company work with uh, transition houses. Brandon's been doing a lot of work with them here in the province because it, it, it is something that we as a company, much like you, have a passion mm -hmm. about as well. So thank you for those very deep and very honest uh, thoughts on that topic. Uh, next question that I have for you, and here it is, is, you know, in our presentations, we talk to students about some of the employment opportunities surrounding online networking and security and your thoughts and what are some of the rep reputable post-secondary education and certification opportunities that teens and young adults can seek out uh, to help in attaining their goals in this field? I mean, you kind of talk about that in your book uh, to a degree, yeah. but I just thought it'd be really good because not only do we have parents that watch this show, but we also have teens who follow us as well. So, you know, what would your message be to them on this specific topic? Because there's, trust me, after we go in and do a presentation, they're all over us. You know, how do we become a white hatter? How do we become an OSINT investigator? You know, all those things. So let's hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get this question. This is probably the biggest question I get too. Um, and one of the reasons I wrote my book, of course, is because, uh, you know, it's difficult um, for young people to know how to break into this field. It's, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go the law enforcement route, or that's not open to me, or I'm not interested in being a police officer. I, I just want to do what you do. Um, 
my the biggest advice I can give to people is figure out first of all what your passion is, what really interests you. Um, it's funny I was having a discussion earlier today, and some people were saying, "Well, I love gaming. Um, you know, is is gaming going to help me uh, if I'm if I spend a lot of time with online games? Does that help me in becoming an investigator?" And and the answer is. Absolutely. Whatever your passion is, whether it's psychology, whether it's profiling, whether it's gaming, whether it's technology, whether it's building computers, whether it's, um, uh, you know, whatever that is, build on that because there is an opportunity to use that in investigations. There are so many different types of investigations and the, because, you know, there is a, in any investigation now, there's going to be a technological element throughout it. Or there's going to be certainly an internet facilitated portion of it, whether that is uh, that the internet is facilitating the communication, the storage of the information, the research that's done to commit the crime, the whether it's used for stalking or whether it's used for cryptocurrency fraud, whatever that is. Uh, future crimes are going to include technology uh, on some level, unless you're talking about, um, you know, the the types of crimes like, you know, the, the physical crimes or the property crimes, in which case, um, you know, join the police, I would say. But if you're looking to be an online investigator, then certainly it's an advantage to have some kind of technical skills but that doesn't mean you have to go all in and be a computer programmer or get a degree in computing science you may choose to get a degree there's a, a university in ireland i can't remember the name of it um but that does a degree in cyber psychology i would love to do that degree myself um if i get an opportunity to do that i would love a degree in cyber psychology uh there's also education in things like geographic profiling, psychological profiling, um, if, if that's your thing, psychology, uh, criminal psychology. There, there are, it depends on where you want to go. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's just so many directions that you can go in. Um, I would say, if, you know, something that would be most useful is um, learn coding learn basic, learn how to code in mm -hmm. a basic way. Yeah. Um, you know, coding in five years won't necessarily look like it looks like now. Uh, you know, we're going to be moving more again into augmented intelligence, artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual reality. All of these areas are going to play more of a part in future investigations. But we're never going to lose that human side of it. We're never going to lose that psychological side. So if you choose to go the psychology route, um, so my daughter, for example, she wanted to, she wants to do what I do. That's, that's always been her passion and she's good at it. You know, she's been raised, uh, with a certain, um, a, a certain skill set around cognitive thinking, around, um, discernment, around critical thinking, uh, you know, around crime. Okay. So what you're saying to me, she takes after her mom. Yeah, that's right. So she's so she's grown up in that, and it's it's become second nature to her. Right. But so she, when she went to university, she went into the criminal justice field. Uh, she, you know, criminology was what she decided to get her degree in. Well, she did one semester, and decided, I'm not sure that this is for me. Yeah. She loved the psychology side of it, though. So now she's probably going to change her major and go go through the criminal psychology part of it because she's more passionate about psychopathy. She's more passionate about what motivates people to do what they do as opposed to going down the criminal justice side, which is, um, you know, dealing in a more reactive way with crime. She's interested in dealing in the more proactive side of investigations. So, uh which is probably a lot more what I do now, which is threat assessment, risk assessment, um, managing um, online threats and risks and uh, delving more into the psychological side of things. So that's her passion. And you don't necessarily know until you start exploring that. So I would say to anybody that is interested in this line of work, there are a hundred different ways that you could go. Um, discover your passion. And don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to deviate from what it is that you think you want to do. Try out a, a number of different things. Um, you know, one of the advantages of COVID 
is that there are so many free courses being offered out there online right now. Um, I, it's it's actually amazing. If I didn't have to work for a living, I would just go and take all these courses because there's such an opportunity to learn so many different things right now. You can take, uh, you know, quite a detailed coding course for less than a hundred dollars. Um, you know, and just so many free, so much free training. So explore a few different things. The the opportunities are out there. And it's very low cost. Um, and it's, you know, at worst, you're going to learn something that you're not interested in. But it will help you decide on that direction that you want to go in. And um, the best job in the world. You know, it's it's interesting because you're right right now with respect to it being free. And so one of the things we say is, you know, it's not about how much time you're spending online. It's what you're doing with that time online. You know, so for all the young people that are watching right now, rather than just consuming, you know, playing games all the time, why don't you go online and learn how to code, learn how to take a basic OSINT course where you're challenging your brain, you're creating critical thinking, which is really important and it'll give you some insight. Like like your daughter, I went and got my Associates of Arts in Criminal Justice. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have done that. Why? Because nothing I learned in that I actually used in policing. You know what? I would have taken a degree in human performance or psychology. You know, Brandon got his degree in sociology with a minor in tech and then he went and got his master's in communication specifically to tech because that's where his interest lies which is really important and with that he too has now become uh, an online investigator and he's really good at what it is that he does so I think you're right I think it's all about finding that passion and sticking with that passion which kind of bridges into another question that's not on here but we kind of uh, uh, approach that before we went online it, about policing you know one of the things that I'm finding frustrating I, I was a cop for 30 years retired as a staff sergeant and one of the one of the frustrations I have is how many police services now across my country and other countries aren't getting into the online crime field, right? Like it's frustrating when I have families connecting with me saying, you know, I got this issue and I'll say, you know, that's something that you should be reporting to the police. And then they say to me, well, I did, but they say there's nothing they can do. It's the internet. So I'd like to kind of maybe pick your brain a little bit more on, on that issue and what you're seeing as well. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I am seeing exactly the same and it, it's, uh, you know, it's a very difficult area right now. Um, the, the police are, uh, you know, I, and I mean, I work all over the world. So, and this is the experience I'm seeing all over the world. Police are understaffed and they are being asked to do more and more with less and less mm -hmm. all the time. Yep. They, the training is always the first thing to be cut yep. when, when budgets are cut, which budgets are repeatedly cut and police officers are being forced to do more, uh, you know, deal with every single type of crime and internet crimes, unfortunately, or, you know, internet facilitated crimes, often, uh, crimes such as stalking or, uh, harassment online. First of all, the police are in some ways powerless uh, to do that because the legislation isn't quite there in certain regions to to give them the powers that they need to deal with that. Um, some of the other challenges that police officers face is that uh, examination of uh, computer equipment, forensic examinations can often take up to 18 months to conduct. So if you've got somebody that is... Mm. Um, that or some kind of crime that requires a forensic examination of computer equipment, you can have an 18 month lag before they even get the results of that back. And, uh, and in, within that time, if they can't gather the evidence for that crime, then it becomes very difficult for them to prove anything. And the victim really can do nothing except sit and wait and maybe try and try some kind of civil case to put an end to some kind of, you know, to whatever's happening because mm -hmm. the evidence isn't there for the police to uh, to to call it a criminal investigation. Uh, not only that, police officers are um, they don't have the time to sit behind a computer and investigate uh, some you know to investigate whatever's happening to you. Uh, so, you know, I think people don't realize how long. OSINT investigations can take or well, how long it's online not like investigations CSI on can take. T it's not like CSI on TV where they can solve it in like an hour? What? That's really? 
<laughs> it's, uh, no, and, and, and you know, it, I, again, it's interesting that uh, all of these crime shows that are out there are very fascinating and, uh, and actually, you know, quite real, a lot of them. My own TV show uh, is, is exactly the same, and I, we get this criticism all the time on my show um, because, you know, we, over the course of our, of, of Hunted, of filming, uh, we film for 28 days and there's over 8,000 hours of footage in my show. Yeah. And the show is actually six hours long, six episodes of one hour. So they're condensing 8,000 hours of footage down to a six hour TV show. And so we have people coming back going, this is completely unrealistic. Like this, this crime doesn't occur like this. And how did you get that CCTV so fast? It takes five days to get CCTV. And we're like, you know, you don't want to watch us sat there on our computers. It's that would not make good TV and it's very boring. But the reality is these investigations take a lot of time and police officers don't have the time quite often or the resources to sit behind a computer. Whereas if you look at it from a criminal perspective, uh, organized criminals in particular have the time, the resources, the money, the motivation, the networks, the communication tools to take as much time as they need. It's in their interest to do that because they know that all they have to do is find, you know, if they target a million victims, all they have to do is get 1% of those people to click through their phishing email and that's effective. It's been worth their time. Police officers, you know, they only have to get it right a few times. Police officers have to get it right every single time. And they don't have the time, they don't have the training, they don't have the resources uh, to help every single victim, especially when the crime is considered to be um, not immediately life-threatening. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. You mentioned something I want to build upon that. You know, when we get post-COVID, and we will, I don't think we'll ever return back to reality. It's going to be a new reality for sure. But there's going to be some fi heavy financial costs. I think you're going to see city budgets being cut and slashed like you wouldn't believe, including police budgets as well. And the first thing to go, as you know, is training issues on that. And, you know, there are departments. Uh, RCMP have a number of intel centers across our country. The Victoria Police Department, we have our own forensic squad. But, and we're pretty lucky in smaller departments that we have a small unit. But the, the, amount, the amount of these calls that are coming in, uh, you know, at our department, if it's a fraud under $5,000, good online fraud, good luck in, in it being investigated for whatever reason, because they just don't have the time to do that. So I, I think it was really interesting. You know, one of the things I wanted to share is that if you want to get involved in online investigations, maybe policing may not be what you're looking for, because I do think in today's world, we're being uh, cops are not just police officers or social workers or parents or babysitters, they're jailers, they're uh, drug and alcohol counts. Like they wear so many different hats yeah. that maybe, uh, you know, for people who are looking to get in this field, maybe there's another way to do it. And, you know, so now that we know that policing is playing catch up and, and the resources are getting much smaller, how do we cope with this issue then, Julie? I mean, like, because we know the criminal element has shifted some uh, into the online world. So how do we now police that? I think what we're going to see in the future is uh, much more collaboration between the public and private sector. I think we're going to have to see that. I think we're going to see um, law enforcement relying more on either contractors or um software providers and providers of tools and and a lot more of this work uh particularly uh threat assessment work social media monitoring geographic uh profiling all of that i think we're going to see more and more of that work being outsourced to contractors and experts in the field who actually have an opportunity and have the training and have the time and the resources uh, to to do that kind of work and take the burden from the police to allow the police to focus on more of the traditional types of police work that uh, that we expect. You know, we have an expectation of law enforcement that we are going to, or that they are going to um, to to protect us all and to protect our property and to protect our lives. We have that expectation. But I don't think that we really factored in or we I don't think we consider how much of uh, the time of law enforcement is taken up with exactly, you know, 
crimes like fraud for less than five thousand dollars or or phishing attacks or um you know people being blackmailed with extortion um, cases sexual I mean, photographs like, or, yeah, or whatever yeah for sure you know it's i think you're right i think you're going to see more collaboration between public and private and i know this really good company that could probably help i think they're called human eye i think is the name of the company. <laughs> but, uh, next question i have for you um is you know what? I believe that the tech industry is very much a male dominated domain. And as a successful fe female tech entrepreneur, which you are an online investigator and a reality TV show star, how do you think we can attract more young teen women to become more involved in the tech industry? That is uh, a big reason. That question right there is a big reason why I wrote my book. Um, it, I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> So when I first, uh, when I came back into this industry, when I decided that I wanted to go from educating people about online investigation to being back on the front lines, um, I reached out to a number of people that I knew in this industry. Mm -hmm. And I tried to find female mentors. I tried to find somebody, well, first of all, I tried to find any mentor. And um, I, I found it to be quite an unfriendly environment. I found that uh, the investigation industry, uh, the private investigation industry, was quite closed off. People um, are very protective about their investigations. They didn't want to collaborate. They didn't want to mentor. Um, people are afraid of competition. And so they, they don't want to share what they know. Plus, as, um, as an industry, we are very secretive. We are very protective. We... we you know, we're so used to operating in such a secretive way. We're used to, and we have to, maintain confidentiality in, in so much of what we do that I think we actually become quite closed off. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, that was definitely my experience when I came into this industry. So I reached out to uh, some of the people that I knew, and I could not find hardly any women in this, uh, in mentorship roles, in leadership positions in this industry. It was lacking. And one of the reasons that I, and then of course I, I ended up doing Hunted and um, I realized that I had become that mentorship person. I had become a role model to a lot of young women out there. Mm -hmm. And I take that very seriously. I know that that was missing for me when I wanted to come back into this industry. I really was looking for a woman or some women, some strong women that I could look up to and that could help me get back into this industry. And this is a very male dominated industry, it still is. Um, we're seeing more and more females coming into the cybersecurity industry mm -hmm. and I have so much admiration for women breaking into this industry. It's not easy. Um, women have so much to offer uh, that we we have a way of thinking in specific ways um you know women and men whether we like it or not have different ways of thinking we are raised in different ways we are influenced in different ways we have different personality traits and i think rather than saying that we don't we shouldn't differentiate between men and women because they're the same we're not we should embrace our differences and we should um, use the skills that we have, regardless of your agenda, though, to uh, to move forward in any industry. In this, you know, as an investigator, as a female investigator, I find that there are, you know, there are certain clients that actually would prefer to talk to a woman. There are certain, um, and that's not just female clients; that's male clients too. But I've suffered certain things and actually would prefer to talk to a woman about it or find that women have certain skills uh, that they bring as an investigator or as a security professional, a certain, certain way that they think um, that is more beneficial. I would love to see more women coming into this industry. I think it is, um, I think women have so much to offer. Girls have so much to offer. Girls are every bit as capable in terms of science, in terms of um, coding in terms of uh, thinking, critical thinking, lack of bias, um, influence over other females, um, 
I just think this industry is uh, is perfect for women and girls. And I would love to see more women come into both the tech industry, the investigation industry, the security industry. You know, it's it's it. It's interesting. Uh, I concur with everything you said there. We have two young women who are just finishing their degrees right now in computer engineering. And one of them is now really interested in doing pen testing. She had never even thought about that. She teaches, they both teach coding through our company and they were starting to learn a little bit more about online investigations. And she was showing a real interest in that and um, really kind of uh, kind of pushing her to look at that if that really interests her, which it does. So um, yeah, I, I, I just think there's so much opportunity opportunity out there and you're truly a leader and the other thing I'd like to comment on is when you said that people don't want to collaborate with others because we're afraid to share secrets well I'm very proud to share with everybody that we collaborate closely with your organization your company where you know if I'm dealing with things I will send them your way and I'm not afraid to do that because you know information to be useful must be shared amongst one another and that's just who I am and I know that's who you are as a company and working together we can attain so many more really cool things and help so many other people right absolutely so next question for you next question we're just about done um what are the three top things uh anyone can do to help minimize online risk so if you were going to give a top three to those people who are watching right now to minimize their risks of being preyed upon for crime online what would those top three be? What would they be? I would say uh, the first one is um, lock down your social media. So that is to make sure that you're engaging uh, privacy settings on your social media, that you are, that, you know, call your friends list. Make sure that you know who you're talking to and who you're being friends with and who has access to your information. Um, you know, it's so easy for um, anybody with that, with any kind of social engineering skills to be able to look across all of your platforms if your information is open and find out quite a lot about you. Uh, and that includes things like answers to your security questions. Um, you know, it's one of the techniques that we used to use on the TV show quite a lot is um, to access somebody's Facebook profile or to hack into somebody's password, uh, find out their security questions, um, because people post that stuff on open social media. So I would say lock down your social media, lock down your photographs, lock down your timeline on Facebook or whatever it is you're using. Um, don't post a lot of personal information on um, publicly available forums. Post, you know, within your friends um environment yeah post what post your stuff there but for publicly available information on instagram on tiktok on wherever it whatever it is you're using make sure that the publicly available side of things is locked down so that would be my first piece of advice my second piece of advice is change your passwords uh change them regularly don't use the same password for everything that you're doing. Data breaches are absolutely prevalent. And something that people don't understand with data breaches is, this is not your fault. The data breach is not coming from you. It's coming from the company that you're giving your data to and that is responsible for uh, you know, preserving your data and locking that down. But you have to do your part too. So you have to make sure that you're regularly changing your password, that you're um, regularly changing your security settings because I'm not even going to say if when a data breach occurs uh, because I actually just don't think most things are secure now I think I think security is so compromised online that it's very difficult to secure anything um, when that data breach occurs you want to be on top of it and you want to make sure that you're changing your password regularly to minimize the amount of information that can be found out about you. You should not be using the same password twice for across the board. You should not be using a password that's easy to detect or easy to guess. Um, you know, a lot of social media sites will give you a partial password we want to reset. And, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, you can look at that password. Somebody can look at it and guess what your password is going to be because it's either your name or, you know, something like that. Or if you're out, you know, if you do end up on a data breach database somewhere, 
it provides your full password. If you're using that password for everything, then your your entire online life is exposed and can be um, compromised. If you're only using that password for one thing, then yes, that one um, website or that one email account is going to be compromised, but everything else isn't. And hopefully, you can um, you know mitigate the damage and the risk to yourself. So passwords is huge. Um, it's one of the biggest things. And then the last thing I would say is. Um, employ all security, all available security measures on every site that you use. So uh, whether that's two-factor authentication, and what I would say about two-factor authentication is, if possible, don't use your phone number for two-factor authentication. Uh, SIM swapping as an attack is becoming more prevalent. There are sites that you can, or there are apps that you can use. Um, if you're if you're going to use a phone number, use a phone number that's not publicly available online, uh, that people don't know, that can't really be stolen. Uh, set up an email account that you don't use for anything else and that you never access through your computer or through your browser, but that you access through uh, some other way, um, not through your phone, absolutely not through your phone, but that you can use as a as a password confirmation um, and as a as a, a two factor authentication for websites. If somebody does a, sw a, a SIM swap, then you could lose access to all of your sites. Uh, you know, and two-factor authentication is then uh, useless. The sites like, uh, or apps like Authenticator and Authy, which you can use for two-factor authentication. Um, so use those apps as opposed to your phone number. Uh, that makes you less vulnerable. But still, that being said, two-factor authentication is still better than not using two-factor authentication. SIM swapping is not easy and is usually a targeted attack. Uh, it takes some physical effort on the part of the criminal to, to conduct a SIM swap. There's usually got to be a deeper reason such as... So just have, for SIM swapping, mm. just so that our listeners who may not know what that is, can you kind yeah. of just maybe explain that briefly about what SIM... Uh, I know what it is, but a lot of our viewers may not. Right. So SIM swapping occurs when uh, somebody, um, they'll, they might go to, they'll find out who your mobile phone provider is. They will go to that provider and say that they've lost uh, the SIM card or something has happened to that connection and they will ask for a new SIM card. They will then put in the SIM card for your phone number and quite often, let's say if I go to a Rogers store or something like that, um, I will, yes, I'll need to produce some ID to say that I am that person, but it's not difficult. Any young person knows it's not difficult to get fake ID uh, or to provide some kind of letter or bill or something to say that I am that person. Once somebody gets your SIM card, uh, they can then put that in their phone and basically take over everything that you have on your phone. You will be locked out of your phone. You will be locked out of all of your accounts and whoever has conducted the SIM swap will then have control of everything that would have been on your phone. That is your text messages, your email accounts, your apps, your online banking, um, all of that. So anything that you access through your phone. So what, um, are, so what are the it's two... It's not an easy thing to do. Sorry, so what... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's a very difficult thing to protect yourself against. And really... It's up to the mobile phone to providers to protect people by making sure that the identification that's provided is is real and is genuine. Um, it all you can do is protect your accounts. Um, it's a it's a fairly new type of phenomenon, uh, but it is I'm seeing it more and more. So, what were the two apps that you mentioned, rather than using your phone number for the two two factor authentication? What were those two apps again? Because we'll make sure that we include that in the uh, YouTube description. Yeah. So one of them is called Authenticator, and one of them is called Authy. A U T H Y. And I think Authy is a Google app. Um, both downloadable, uh, and actually, lots of different sites allow you to use Authenticator and Authy. Um, to secure your account for two-factor authentication instead of a phone number or email. Yeah, I knew and we, we it's use easy a... to do it. It's easy as well. They, those sites will give you a QR code that you can just scan with your phone, and it will set it up right there on your phone. So there's not. It's very simple to do. Perfect. Um, 
last question I have for you. I end all my presentations this way, uh, which is your final thoughts specific to social media safety and digital literacy while we navigate this ever-changing world event, what's going on with COVID-19. So how would you like to close? I would just say to people that, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in not being scared of the internet. It, the internet is an amazing, fabulous resource and tool that we have. Um, if you can learn to confidently navigate, to um, think critically about what you're seeing, uh, one of the biggest issues that I see uh, with online data, and this is getting you know more and more prevalent, particularly with things like deep fakes and that kind of thing, be discerning about what you're seeing. Stop and think. Do a gut check. Is it right? Is what you're seeing accurate? Is it likely to be true? Don't believe everything you read. But also, you know, take a few minutes. And whether this is in chat, whether this is in, uh, you know, on, on sites, whether it's on social media, wherever that is, take a few minutes to just think about what, whether what you're seeing is verifiable, is the source real, is the data real and true, can you rely upon it? And just learn to to think more critically about what it is that you're seeing. I mean, the, I could give 50 different pieces of advice here. I, I have so many thoughts about, um, you know, this is my world. So there's so many things I could say here. But I would say in today's current environment where more and more people are online, um, you know, most of our decisions now involve some kind of online influence one way or another whether that is how we think about ourselves how we make decisions about our life and our future our relationships our work just learn to be discerning learn to stop and think critically evaluate what you're seeing and make your own decision about what it is that you're seeing about what you believe to be the truth try and not allow yourself to be so influenced uh, by what you're seeing you know what, uh, Julie, big tip of my white hat to you. Uh, I learned uh, a couple of new things today. I mean, this is why I love these thinkable Thursdays, right? Yeah, it's I'm constantly drinking from the cup, right, to, to fill that, that cup. And it's it just I want to thank you for taking the time to share some of your thoughts on these topics that I think a lot of people, especially young people, are interested in getting into the industry. And especially as a female leader, CEO, uh, sharing your passion with everybody. So stick around because I have some questions that I want to talk to you about after the show is over. But for everybody else who's watching, thank you for tuning in to today's session on Thinkable Thursday. Day. We just love doing these and, you know, and connecting with thought thinkers and leaders in the community such as Julie. And I hope you'll uh, check out our next one next Thursday where we're going to be speaking to both a high school teacher and a high school counselor to ask them about what's going on right now in the COVID world and how they and their students are coping with some of the challenges that they're facing. So on behalf of myself, I'm Darren uh, Brandon, who's working behind the scenes and the rest of the uh, White Hatter team and especially to Julie uh, for connecting with us. Don't forget Get. I'll give her another plug. Here's her book right there, a world-class investigator. Really good book. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, check it out. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.